Uh, presentation, please close the door as quietly as possible. Yeah, like that. Uh, if you want, you can evaluate uh, sessions uh, in this link. Uh, please tweet about the presentation, uh, about the conference, and write blog posts about the conference. And I should promote a grand finale today and the end at uh, 16.30 at the 105 there will be a awesome uh, things to win and now please welcome new presenter Nathaniel McCallum and something about cryptography <laughs> thank you very much can everybody hear me yeah. all right we're going to start off with a question how many of you here have a laptop with an encrypted disk Okay, that's a really good number, okay? Now we're going to do another question. How many of you are feeling really guilty that your hand wasn't raised before? Anybody? Yeah, all right, we've got some honest people, right? Because sometimes encryption can be a little bit, a bit of pain. We're going to talk about uh, some of the problems of key management and how we hope to solve them. I do ask your patience. Uh, we are having some technical difficulties. Uh, my slide, unfortunately, is on the cloud. It is not on a USB key. And apparently, the cloud provider had a massive data failure. And the entire database or the entire data center went down. There was the, the battery backup didn't work and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to try to hobble through this. Uh, and actually, I was able to uh, get a live feed here from their data center. And unfortunately, they're all running around like crazy right now because this is popping up everywhere in their data center. And uh, so we really need to ask a, a question, right? Can we automate this? Because if, if you know, usability is a major impediment to security, uh, this is something we should really try to solve. So before we can answer that question, let's look at uh, how this encryption is typically done. So it all starts off with a secret, right? Oftentimes, this secret is your, your hard disk. It could be some data that a service has. Uh, but it's, we have something that we want to keep secret. And then we usually encrypt that secret in using an encryption key. Now, as soon as your secret grows in size, uh, one of the things you're going to quickly realize is that you don't want to constantly re-encrypt your data, because that's a lot of work. In fact, there was a really great talk about, uh, about Lux2 disk re-encryption. They're going to be doing it live, so it's really, really cool stuff. So check that out on the web if you didn't go to the talk. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, re trying to re-encrypt anything that is of, of a sizable amount is just very difficult. Uh, so what do we do in the case of compromised keys? Well, we actually wrap this in another key. Okay, so we have the encryption key, which protects the data itself. And then we have a key encryption key, which protects the encryption key. And the reason that we do this is that if the outer key is compromised, uh, we can just change the outer key without having to change the inner key. Okay, then you don't have to re-encrypt re re your data. <clears throat> and the typical way that this is often deployed, as you saw in the beginning of my slide, uh, is that you start up your computer and you have some kind of a password and you type your password in. And uh, what that password does is it gives you the, uh, the password is the key encryption key. The key encryption key is then used to decrypt the encryption key. And then the encryption key is used to decrypt the data. And then, of course, this is distributed out to all of the admins who are supposed to have access to this device. Of course, this, this immediately comes with a problem. Uh, you have multiple people all sharing this password. Uh, and there are lots of ways to get around this. Lux gives you multiple slots, for instance. Uh, and that's a, that's a great solution. Uh, but it does have its limitations. It doesn't scale. And so one of the ways that we can try to automate this uh, is we actually uh, generate something that's a little stronger cryptographically. So uh, here we have a, a cryptographically strong random key. And then we store this in some remote system, which we can then fetch at a later time. And this is pretty much the standard escrow model. Or is it? Can anybody tell what I'm missing here? What's that? More encryption keys. You see, because we can't just transfer this key over the wire. Because if we did so, then anybody who was listening, of course, could immediately figure out what our key was, and then we would be sunk. So we've got to encrypt the channel with which we distribute the key. And this is typically done with TLS or with GSS API. And uh, now we're done, right? 
oh yeah, we, we actually have to authenticate the, the parties, right? Because we can't just send this magical key to some server if we don't know that the server is the server that it's claiming to be. So the server itself has to have a key as part of this uh, authentication, some kind of ident identity, right? And we're done, right? No, because we're gonna fetch the key back. So now we have to know that the client also has a key so that this server can verify that this person is supposed to get the key that they're supposed to get. So anybody notice the tendency here? We're getting a lot more what? Keys, okay? So now we need a central place to manage all of these keys. And this is typically done with either a KDC in the case of uh, using Kerberos, for instance, with GSS API, uh, or you'll have some kind of a certif certification authority if you're using TLS. And of course, you have to handle the issuance of the keys, you have to handle the revocation of the keys, because if anything happens, uh, if those keys are compromised, then your key encryption key is compromised, and so on down the chain. And of course, we also have to have backups, right? Because we can't just deploy this now complex system uh, without having some way to restore to this very complex state. Because keep in mind, this escrow server is probably storing lots of keys from lots of different places. And if we all of a sudden lose this escrow key, we are lose this escrow server's data, we're really sunk. So we have to keep really accurate backups up to the minute, right, with all the keys that are changing hands. Uh, and this is a fully stateful process here. So, finally, we are done. We can rest assured that there is not gonna be any kind of problem whatsoever. Dang it. Well, you see, we have this problem now that we're using encryption all over the place to try to protect our keys. Uh, but we, all we're doing is increasing complexity in the stack. And anytime that we increase complexity in the stack, we're increasing our attack surface. And so every little link in this diagram now is a potential point of vulnerability for our system. So what we've done here is we've made it truly easy to get the key back, but we've also opened up ourselves to a lot of new risk. So we've learned a few lessons here. We've learned that complexity, complexity increases the attack surface. We learned that escrow is difficult to deploy. And we also learned something else which is that speed matters. Because if we go back a slide here, notice all of this complexity. Every single hop in this complex chain adds latency. And so when you have a, a data server of 100,000 servers all coming up at the same exact time from a power outage, what's gonna happen to this server right here? We're gonna have a massive bottleneck, a denial of services. All of these servers come online at once and try to get their keys back. So speed matters. So question number two, can asymmetric cryptography help us here? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, and what we did is a year ago, actually after the last DevConf, uh, in some brainstorming meetings, we came up with a new model and we called this the Deo project. Deo was uh, Greek for I bind. Uh, so, so binding things together is the idea. And one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to move the state out of the escrow server, okay? So in this case, what we do is we take this key encryption key and we encrypt it again using the public encryption key of the server. Notice we're doing asymmetric cryptography now. This step can actually be done offline as long as the client has these, the server's public key. And the end result is that all of our secrets still reside on the client in this system, right? So we no longer have any complex state on the escrow side of the equation. So then what we do is during the time in which we want to do decryption of this key, we then send the encrypted key encryption key to the DAO server. The DAO server just uses its local key, which can be stored in memory, so it's all very fast and stateless, and it can return back the disk encryption key. Notice it didn't store anything, and so we, don't, we no longer have a central point of compromise in the server, and also uh, we've reduced the load significantly because we're not calling out for disk I.O. every time a request comes in. So this is definitely an improvement. Uh, however, we have some keys here as well. Uh, we have two keys in particular. First, we have a key uh, for encrypting the channel where the key is being transferred across. 
And second, we have the asymmetric key pair uh, for doing the public key crypto. And so this is, this is better. We don't have like a full assortment of all of these, these arrays of keys, uh, but we still do have some keys which pre present some complexity. Uh, and we still do have the sort of heart bleed problem, right? If anybody can penetrate uh, this outer layer of encryption, then when the key is coming back in its decrypted state to the client, at that point, uh, if somebody can break the encryption, then they can get the key. So we also still have certificate authority and backups. And one of the things that we discovered when writing this software, and in fact, there was releases of this software, um, and one of the things we discovered that this part here actually made it pretty complex to deploy, uh, even with fairly step-by-step -step instructions uh, when people were trying to reproduce this setup, they had difficulty. And we thought that that was not a really great way to start. So we began to look again. And we learned some lessons here. Asymmetric crypto makes it so that the server is stateless. And we really like this feature because it means that we can get high performance. It also means uh, that we can reduce attack points like, say, uh, on the disk chain and whatnot. Uh, the asymmetric crypto also allows for offline provisioning, which is a really nice feature. Uh, particularly think of in cases uh, you know, where you might have spotty internet connectivity. You, you can have the public key on the flash drive, provision a whole bunch of systems, uh, and then when the network comes back up, you can, you can continue to work. Uh, but one of the things that we identified was that sending the keys over the wire is a risk. And we'd like to ask, can we do better than that? We also learned that X509 takes a lot of effort. So, our project died. Uh, we killed it, and we moved on to something which we think is better. So let's move to question number three. Must the key go on the wire? Now, my intention today is to kill someone with math. So <laughs> I want to see a hand if you're dead later. So this is just standard Elgamal encryption. Okay, this is, this is not me doing anything, anything special. Uh, what we do is uh, the server generates a key pair, sends the public key to the client. The client will generate its key pair and will encrypt some data using it. And then when you want, to, and then now the data is encrypted. And when you want to perform decryption on the other side, uh, the client returns uh, this, K, this A value and this K value to the server. The K value is the encrypted value. And the server performs a mathematical operation and returns the uppercase K here, which is the plain text data. Okay? So this is actually going to be the basis for the new crypto in this project. We're going to move one step over. Watch very carefully. We'll go back and forth a few times. Notice that nothing on the left-hand side changes. Okay? So the left-hand side which of Elgamal encryption is going to stay exactly the same. In this key exchange, we add only one thing, which is we take uh, this X value here and we, gener we generate an ephemeral key pair. And by mixing this additional ephemeral key pair at decryption time into the value that we send to the server, we can send the key to the server. The server performs its side of the mathematical equation and returns back the result, and we can now calculate the K, rather than the server calculating the K. Now, the interesting thing that this does is this means that there's no K ever on the server. That means the server never knows anything about what's going on in the client. It just simply says, I can perform this mathematical operation, and if you can contact me, then I can perform it for you. But it knows literally nothing about the client, at least algorithmically. So, we created a new project called Tang. And this is the Tang model. It looks very similar to what we had before. Uh, we have our secret in the middle. We have our encryption key. We have our key encryption key, which is generated as part of the exchange with our Tang server. There's a lot of stuff missing in this slide now. Notice that there's no longer a TLS channel here. And that's because this is done completely over the wire. It's the same as a Diffie-Hellman, uh, same properties as like a Diffie-Hellman exchange or a public Elgamal encryption. Uh, by transferring these over values over the wire, nobody gets any advantage. And this is provably secure. So 
the end result is that our key encryption key always stays local and the server never sees anything. Of course, we still do have to have backups, but our backups are much more limited in scope now. And the reason for this is because we have, oops, let me go back here. Uh, we have in Tang uh, a set of keys for doing encryption. These keys can be generated uh, at, at will, whatever, whatever your key rotation policy states. Uh, and at that time, they can be inserted in backups. But aside from key rotation, there is absolutely no state whatsoever on the server. And so this makes for a very, very limited attack footprint. The size of this server is extremely small. This is the, uh, the project page here. And this includes the server-side daemon with the clevis pin, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Don't get too excited. Uh, we are nearing our first release, and it has an extensive test suite. It's really fast. So we can handle north of 30,000 requests per second. So if you think of a data center where you've got 100,000 machines all coming up across the span of about five, th five seconds, we can handle this on one computer. So very, very lightweight, very, very fast, very, very small attack surface, and substantially tested. So now that we have uh, accomplished this task of taking that secret that we want, that data, and we've now bound it to a third party, and it can only be decrypted in the presence of that third party, let's do a little brainstorming about some of the other kinds of things that we could do. Uh, obviously, the, the one that Intel would be very interested in us using is the trusted platform module, and this indeed would guarantee that, the, for instance, the disk is in the computer. Right? Because there's a physical connectivity is what we're testing for there. And think, start thinking now in terms not of keys, but in terms of relationships. Right? So in this first case, we have a relationship between a disk being in a chassis. In the second case, we have a Bluetooth LE beacon. So we can implement this Tang protocol over Bluetooth low energy. And you could say up in the ceiling of your office, you could have this Bluetooth low energy beacon. And only the people that are within that you know, 30 feet, 50 meters, whatever the range is, uh, not 50 meters, but whatever the range is on your, on your Bluetooth beacon, um, you know, that's the range in which they will be able to perform decryption. And if they go outside of that range, they can't perform decryption anymore. Another case might be that we, uh, during the provisioning time, we, we generate a random key and we print a QR code, and you take that QR code and you stick it in a safe, Right? And this is your, this is your last ditch recovery at this point. Uh, all other methods of decrypting the data have failed, and so you take this physical key and you go and unlock the safe and get back your QR code and then you scan it in the, uh, in the webcam. So obviously techniques like uh, facial recognition, fingerprint scans, mobile phones uh, can do the same thing with Bluetooth. Right, using the same protocol, uh, and then the standard uh, smart card and RFIDs. So these are all different kinds of relationships that your data can have with objects. Now, how many of you went to Josh Bresser's talk yesterday on security, security everything? It was a fantastic talk. And one of the things that he said in this talk I think is really worth highlighting, which is that security is not a binary. And oftentimes when particularly doing encryption, we often think in these binary terms, right? Is the data secure or is it not secure? And one of the things I wanted to do in shifting us to thinking about relationships between data and the third parties is that we can actually now begin to think in terms that are not necessarily binary. And this, is, this should not surprise us at all because this is precisely the way that we human beings think. When we walk into a room, we can quickly assess many factors in the room. And, you know, let's say I find a white fridge in a room. Uh, well, that may not be anything on its own. Uh, but if I find a white fridge and, uh, you know, a bunch of other white stuff and a surgical table and, you know, I might start to piece together that maybe this is a hospital, right? So we, we gather all of these pieces of data and we weigh them collectively and we establish the relationships between them and based upon this, uh, we can reason about things, and this is oftentimes the way that we reason about security, right? If you, when you're asking the question, maybe, am I in a safe environment? Am I in a good part of town? There's not a sign that says, you are now entering the bad part of town, right? 
If there was, lots of people would get sued, probably. So, uh, so there's not a sign that's telling us that. And so the way we reason about it is that we enter into that environment and we begin to have relationships with all of the objects that are around us. And we begin to reason in ways that are not necessarily binary about our relationships between these objects. And so one of the questions we want to ask next is how do we make unlock policy non-binary? And there's actually a way to do this. It's a technique called Shamir's secret sharing. And the way that Shamir's works is that it allows you to take a key, one of your security keys here, and you can split it up into an arbitrary number of subkeys. You also, during this operation, define a threshold. The threshold can be like one, in which case, if any of these keys are present, then we can recalculate this key. If the threshold is two, we would need two out of these five to recalculate the main key, and so on, all the way up to five. So we can, now with Shamir's actually express complex relationships between objects, so we can begin to, as a computer, reason in a way that is fairly similar to the way that humans reason, uh, which is, uh, one of the other things is that this can be nested, right? So you can actually then take Shamir's and apply it again and split this key out, and so you can have nested policy. And using this, we can create fairly complex sets of relationships between objects. So let's take an example uh, of a simple laptop. This laptop's been issued to you by corporate IT. You're probably uh, being, if you're using Linux, you're probably encrypting with Lux, and Lux has a great facility uh, called slots, and you can have so many slots, and there's an or relationship between the keys. Well, we can do the same, we can express the same kind of relationship with Shamir's by simply specifying a threshold of one. In this case, either one of these keys will allow us to reconstitute this key. As a result, the admin can lo log in with his or her password, or the user can log in with his or her password. Right? And so this makes a lot of sense because you don't want the admin knowing what your password is. You want to be able to use your password on a day-to-day -day basis, but the admin also needs to be able to recover your data if something were to happen. And so we can express this now in a Shamir's relationship with a threshold of one. Now let's add Tang into the mix, right? So this is the same exact setup, but now we're automated. So we still have the admin password for recovery, uh, and we still have the user password uh, for, for the case where the Tang server is not available. But if the Tang server is present, we're going to automatically unlock the laptop, right? which is a really, really useful feature. So think of how this might work in, an, in maybe an office setting where you walk into the office on Monday morning and uh, you turn on your laptop and it boots and you don't type anything because it was on the corporate network and it was able to talk to the Tang server. It has a relationship with that Tang server and therefore the decryption can work. But then on Friday night, you decide to take your laptop and go sit at a coffee shop. Well, you're no longer on the corporate network. You're now on some uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. And in this case, you do not have access to Tang. So when you turn on your laptop, you're gonna get prompted for a password. So fairly simple ways to approach these, begin to approach these complex relationships. Let's say we have a high security system, right? In this case, we want to guarantee that no one user can decrypt the system by him or herself. And in this case, we've now set the threshold to two. So we have three user passwords, and so long as any two of them are there to type in their passwords, they can now unlock the system. Here's a complex policy but one that actually has some use. And now you can begin to think about the way that we human beings also relates to these objects. In this policy, we have three layers of nested shamirs. The first layer has a threshold of one and has a QR code uh, as, its, as its method of input. This is the recovery step, right? If all else fails, you should be able to scan that hard-coded uh, QR code and get into the system uh, and the QR code is kept locked in a safe somewhere. But if, that, if you can't do that, now we move on to the next level. At this next level, we have a threshold of two, which means that both of these branches must hold true. So we must have TPM. In other words, the disk must be in the chassis. So this allows now for the admin to pull the disk out of the chassis and use the QR code. But in a normal case, the disk must remain in the chassis. Now we go down our next branch. 
our threshold here is two again, which means that we need two methods of authentication. And in this case, we have four options. We can type in our password, we can scan our fingerprint, we can contact a tank server, or we can do Bluetooth proximity, right? So let's say you're sitting at your desk in your office, underneath the Bluetooth beacon, and you're on the corporate network. Well, when you boot your system, you're gonna get in automatically because these two are going to return values. But now let's say you walk into the conference room and you're not sitting at your desk. Uh, now you're going to still have access to Tang because you're on the corporate network, but you're not gonna be in, in proximity to your Bluetooth. And so now we need to provide one of these other two. And typically you'll probably provide a fingerprint scan because it's easy, you don't have to think about it, you just swipe your finger. Now again, you go out to the coffee shop and so we still need two methods of authentication. In this case, you can specify your password and your fingerprint. So this is a fairly complex policy, but you can actually think now about the scenarios in which this provides a very good user experience in high security environments, which we've determined by analyzing our surroundings, right? So this is the quote I wanna leave us on. We need to let business policy drive crypto policy, not vice versa. And the reason I say this is because oftentimes we get in this conversation where we're asked, well, how can we keep our data secure? And we can say, well, you have this one option or this two options, right? What we really need to be able to say now is we need to be able to describe scenarios where it's not just a binary, and where we can, in high security environments, we can provide high usability, where we don't even have to say enter passwords, uh, but then as we transition out of those high security environments into lower security environments, at that point, then our authentication policy gets stricter and stricter. And so, note that this is not binary. We actually have multiple steps in these tiers. So this is actually implemented by a project called Clevis, and you can see the URL there. This is client-side pluggable key management. So before when I said that Tang had a Clevis pin, a Clevis pin is a plugin for this framework. Uh, <clears throat> so this actually provides uh, HTTPS, which is the standard escrow case that lots of people are already using. So Clevis can just go into that environment and work out of the box. We also have support for Custodia, which is a really, really awesome um, key transfer framework and API that Simo is working on. Where are you, Simo? In the back. If you have questions, talk to him. It's really cool. So we actually support that out of the box. Uh, we have support for Tang, although it's not in this repo, it's in the Tang repo. So, uh, so we did that to avoid circular dependencies. Uh, we have support for password and support for Shamir's. This is minimal dependencies. Uh, we only require OpenSSL and libjansen, uh, but if you want HTTPS, currently we, re we require libcurl. Uh, we are working also on early boot integration and this project is a little bit behind the Tang project, uh, where the Tang project is about to get its first release and is extensively tested. Uh, this is still undergoing active development. Uh, however, I can give you a demo. So we're gonna start off here by actually bringing up our Tang server you can see that the Tang server is actually already running, but there's no keys. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a key. And to do this, let me make that full size. So to do this, uh, we run the Tang gen command. Uh, capital A means that we're gonna advertise this key. We're gonna pick a, uh, a crypto group to use. And this is a signature key we also have to create a recovery key. So that's it, I don't have to do anything else. My server has already picked up that those keys are available and we'll use them to any incoming connections. So let's switch now to uh, talking about Clevis. So we're gonna go to the provisioning step. We're gonna start off pretty simple, just a plain old password. So what we have here is we have the Clevis command and we're gonna provision this is gonna be our pin layout, and we're, we're only specifying one pin, and that's password. And then we're gonna store the provisioning metadata in a file called XXX. 
So now we, it's being, we're being prompted for the password that we want to use on this provisioning. I'm going to type in foo. And it generates our cryptographically strong master key. This is, uh, we're using currently uh, AES-128, and so this is a 128-bit key, uh, but it's encrypted using the password. And now we can actually look in the file, and we can see that it's just really a, a little bit of JSON uh, where we're encrypting the cryptographically strong key using the password and key derivation and a variety of other parameters there. And by the way, if you were in the Lux talk, you heard about the Lux metadata area, uh, which is now going to be in JSON. Notice that this is in JSON. Wonder what that might be about. Um, so now we want to, that's, this is for setup, right? So we've now set up, uh, say, our partition. And the next thing we want to do is we want to unlock it. And this process is called acquiring. And so we run the acquire, we type in our password again, and we get back our cryptographic key. So now we want to do this in a completely automated way. So we're going to provision again, but this time we're going to use Tang. So again, we're specifying just one pin, which is a type Tang, and we have uh, the, the host to contact is localhost. So we're going to run this, and it's going to ask us if we want to trust our keys. This is the same exact type of behavior you would get in, say, SSH. So we're going to do trust on first use. We're going to trust those keys, and it generates uh, our secure crypto key there. And we run the acquisition process again, and without any password, we get back the same key. So this key, by the way, would be piped into your disk encryption or uh, whatever else. So let's look at one more example before we move on to nesting. I'm going to start this little uh, HTTP server. And all it does is you can post data to it, and it retains the data, and then you can get the data back. So it's like a fairly typical escrow service. And so we're going to provision again. And this time, we are going to provision uh, using our HTTP plugin right there. And we're going to specify the format, which is binary, which means we're just sending the binary blob to the server. So we run it again. And you notice that we got a put request over here on the server. So we've stored that in the HTTP server. Now we run acquisition. We're going to get that object back from the server. And we have the same exact crypto key again. All right, now we are going to look at nesting these with Shamir's. So here's an example with Shamir's. So we, our root plugin is going to be Shamir's, and we're going to have a threshold of one. We're going to have two children pins. One of them is password, and one of them is Tang. So this handles the case where if the Tang server is available, you type in your password, or you don't type in your password. But if the Tang server is not available, then you type in your password. So we'll provision this. It asks us for a password, and it will contact the Tang server. We trust the keys, and it outputs our cryptographic key. We run acquisition. Now watch this. It's prompting for the password, but I'm going to do nothing. And as soon as it gets the result back from the Tang server, then uh, we get back the same key immediately. We do not have to wait uh, and type in a password because our threshold was one. So uh, we can now change this threshold to two. And now we're going to require both. So we'll type in our password again. We will trust our keys from the server. And now we unlock using the acquisition step. And now I'm going to wait again, and I'm getting a result from the server, but it's not going to continue because our threshold is 2. At this point, we have to type in our password in order to complete the chain. And once the chain is completed, we get our key back. Question? What happens if you stop? What's happens if what? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Not a problem. Uh, so let's stop. Well, I guess we can't. Let's do system.
So we'll stop the service and we'll stop the socket that activates the service. And now we'll run our acquisition step again. I'll type in my password, but it's going to time out and not print a key because the Tang server is not available and our exit status is non-zero. Yes? I'm sorry, what was the question? I can't hear it. Uh, okay, so rotation is not currently implemented. Uh, it's going to be coming hopefully soon. And the way that it works is that well, the key that we trusted at the beginning of that phase was actually not the key that we're using for distribution. That's actually the signing key. If you remember at the start of the demo, I created two keys, a signing key and a recovery key. The signing key is used to sign the advertisement of what keys the server has. And that's the key we trust. So our trust follows the chain of signing keys. Then the signing keys can sign other signing keys, and then they can also sign recovery keys. So at that point, what happens on the server is when you want to rotate the keys, you just generate new keys uh, like we just did, and then you modify the, the previous keys to not be advertised. This means that the new, the new clients will get the new keys, but the old clients using the old keys will still continue to work. And then when the, uh, when the clients running the old keys perform their rotation, they will see the new keys in the advertisement upgrade to the new keys. And after all the clients are updated, then you can re finally remove the old keys from the server. What's that? Yes. This is where the names come from, by the way. Uh, it comes from uh, any, any of the old techniques for binding things together, like old handcuffs, for instance. If, you, if you've ever seen in museums old Roman handcuffs, uh, they, you'd put your wrist through here, and there would be a C-shaped thing that's called a clevis. And then the thing that it gets hooked to is the tang, and then the pin is what binds it. So that's where our terminology comes from. Any other questions? Yes. Nothing. It's a, and that's the whole point is that because you're sitting at your desk, we consider that to be a high security environment, right? And this is part of that acceptable risk trade-off. Uh, so again, security is not binary. It's something that people want some trade-off for security. So they want to identify areas or situations in which a higher security policy is required and other situations in which a lower security policy is required. So the answer is nothing prevents that. And that choice was not made by me. That's something that's really important. That choice was not made by me as a developer. It was made by the administrator who deployed it. And that was made based upon business justifications, which is why I said, and I highlighted this phrase, let the business policy drive the crypto policy, not vice versa. So they realized it was an acceptable trade-off, and they chose that behavior. What other questions? Yes. Yes, it's it's theoretical. We haven't implemented it. Well, if you, if you have a ThinkPad, you probably have a uh, fingerprint scanner, so the practicality is pretty high. Uh, you use you would use the fingerprint to encrypt a random key, and the random key would then be handed back to the chain and to undo the Shamir's chain. Can you reliably get some, something yes, that's exactly the way the fingerprint scanning works. Um, this is the, the protocol itself. Uh, I believe you're talking about the key exchange. Um, 
It's been, it was published on, uh, on several crypto lists. You, you were actually on those lists and you commented. Uh, so I think, that's, I think that's why you're asking. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it was published to several crypto lists. Uh, we also advertised it uh, at the Storage Developer Conference. Uh, and there was a crypto guy there who looked at it. Uh, so the answer is it's not, as, it's not been as reviewed as I would like. Uh, and you are happy to review it. And we will, we will definitely take that review. Can you think of some? Give me some ideas. I'll take them. OK, looks like we're out of time. Thank you uh, very much for coming. Uh, if you were one of the people that asked questions, there's, I forgot to give out these scarves, but they're up here. If you want one, come get them. I think it went well. Yeah, I, so I ran into the case where there was more than one thing I wanted to see. <laughs> right next to mine. <laughs> uh. So you should have plenty of time, right? Yeah, to catch everything. I have to take it, so I will just go ahead.